If you click this video, you're probably interested in learning AD Carry. Congratulations, you picked arguably the hardest role mechanically speaking in the game. This role is notorious for its high APM gameplay and being a high priority target for all of your opponents. But when mastered, you can be one of the most important assets to your team. This role is a huge skill check, and while I normally don't recommend AD Carry to newer players, I would be a hypocrite to put others off this role as their first role because AD Carry was the first real main I felt attached to, and still do to this day, even though I mostly jungle now. While I'm no challenger to your AD Carry, I do believe I have studied and have enough experience to help you pick the role up faster and, see, and start seeing some results. I will be trying my best to condense this all into a 20 to 30 minute video for your viewing pleasure. My name is Divinity, and welcome to the art of AD Carry. The Attack Damage Carry, a role designated to a member of the team that primarily plays a ranged 80 champion and builds critical strike chance in the bot lane. These are general rules and nowadays you will tend to see marksmen play in the top and mid lane, or mages play bot lane, but for now just assume all marksmen will be in the bot lane and building AD, not AP. You are generally very weak early and your kit is designed to scale hard into late game. That's why typically you'll have a support to accompany you. To ensure your safety and scale as efficiently as possible, whether that's helping you sustain through damage, feed you kills, help you ward, or just have another set of eyes on the map. The main job of the AD carry is to do the most damage as possible while being as safe as possible and not dying. Generally speaking, you eventually will surpass everyone on the team in terms of DPS, 
Some AD carries will spike in power faster than others, some will scale harder than others. It's up to you to find a champion that's right for you, learn their kit, and at what points of the game they are strong. A general rule of thumb I like to remind myself in games is that as an AD carry, I'm not a real champion until I have three items. So I will tend to play safe and farm unless I see a guaranteed advantage over my opponent. The more you play the role and the more you understand your champion, the better you will be at recognizing game state and where you fit in that game state at any given moment. My favorite metaphor for League is comparing it to gridiron football. If the junglers are the quarterbacks calling the shots and doing the playmaking, then you're the wide receiver. Your job is to metaphorically catch the ball and make the most out of the play provided. Sometimes, the ball is uncatchable though, and you need to learn how to avoid bad plays and save yourself. I will be giving you my recommendations of AD carries that are very beginner friendly, in my opinion, but you don't have to play them if you choose not to. This is a video game after all, and the most important part is to have fun. Ignore what people tell you are overpowered and what the supposed new flavor of the patch notes is. It's the best way to find a champion that best suits you. Find that champion you connect with the most and start putting the reps in. For my first ADC recommendation, the Sniper Mommy, Caitlyn. She has one of the highest auto attack ranges in the game, if not one of the highest, only matched by Aphilios when he has his sniper weapon. This makes her an insane lane bully and has very good laning presence. If played correctly, your opponent should have a difficult time in lane not getting poked out and forced under their tower or to back. If vision allows, you could perma shove waves under enemy towers and harass them while they are trying to last hit minions and get early tower plate gold. If left unattended by the rest of the enemy team, you will eventually take the tower and have the ability to shove the enemy wave to tier 2, swap lanes with your top or mid laner and help them siege their towers while they farm shoved waves in your previous lane. She scales extremely well, being one of the best 6 item AD carries in the entire game. Late game headshot passes will either melt tanks or one shot champions with little to no armor. And lastly, the most important reason to play Caitlyn, Pool Party Caitlyn. She's however a very macro intensive champion, if you want to get the most out of her anyway. You could count this as a pro since I personally think the best way to learn good macro decisions is from playing Caitlyn. She has a lot of tools and strengths at her disposal, but if not used correctly, she can fall behind very fast. Playing Caitlyn from behind is awful. As you may expect, if a champion excels at being a lane bully and getting early leads, the way she's balanced is that if she doesn't get those leads, she will be useless for a while. This con can be set for all AD carries, but being that Caitlyn provides nothing but doing damage and zoning, if she isn't strong enough to do that when the time comes, she provides little to no CC or anything else useful, so please bear that in mind. Ash, like Caitlyn, has a really good attack range with her W and her autos. With this, she has a really good lane presence and can be a huge nuisance in lane as well. She is known as the Kiting Queen. Her auto attacks slow her targets, and when you would normally critically strike, the slow is increased even further. Pairing this with approach velocity, once you have a slow on someone, they're in what I call the glue factory, and they are never getting away from you. She provides a lot of utility for your team, especially for an AD carry. Her ult is a long single target stun with an AoE slow upon impact. This means even while you are behind, you can still remain useful to your team by trapping enemies in your slow and hitting game-changing ultimates even from across the map. Ash's ult is a global ult, meaning it can be fired from anywhere and will fly until it's impacted in an enemy. Her ult also has a very low cooldown. Her E is also just free vision on cooldown. It's basically a cheat code to know where the jungler is at all times throughout the laning phase so that you can play your lane accordingly or to provide vision to critical objectives that aren't warded. Personally, jungling against an Ash is a pain since she will just fire Hawkshot into your jungle on cooldown and know exactly where you are. Very difficult to play against. However, she is a very one-dimensional champion. There isn't much mechanics to learn about her, and her abilities are pretty straightforward. You auto, you slow, you stun, you kite. Perfect for beginners who don't want to be overwhelmed by requiring to learn niches about champions and tough mechanics to make the champion optimal, but will be outshined by other AD carries played at a higher level. This is why you don't see many Ash one tricks above Diamond Elo. There's just better AD carries out there that do their job better than her in most situations. She lacks in DPS compared to the rest of her AD carry companions. She is usually outscaled by her counterparts that can critically strike. That doesn't mean you can't do work on her though, but just know, the trade-off you get for all the utility you have in your kit is the maximum damage output you can do compared to other AD carries. She technically cannot critically strike, 
Instead, your damage comes from the fact that auto attacks against enemies who are slowed by your passive frost shot deals bonus damage and that bonus damage is increased based on critical strike chance. I know that sounds confusing, so let me give you an example. At 0% critical strike chance, Ash will do 110% bonus damage upon an accessible auto attack on an enemy with frost shot applied. If you have 40% critical strike chance, then the damage is increased to 150%. Building Infinity Edge will give you an additional 20% more frost shot damage, as well as adding more damage to this unique passive, which grants an additional 35% additional damage. An honorable mention I would like to bring up is Ezreal. He is one of the safest AD carries to play. He has a built-in flash in his kit, allowing him to get himself out of danger or reposition himself in fights. There's a couple reasons I wouldn't play him if I were new though. You need to land your skill shots to maximize the damage output and know how to weave in auto attacks in between abilities. His safe nature is also what baits newer players into playing too safe. His auto attack range is short compared to most AD carries, so most inexperienced players get comfortable sitting back and throwing cues. If you're going to maximize Ezreal's potential, you need to play extremely aggressive in the faces of the enemies, and that's something I cannot expect from a new player. However, if you are interested in playing him, don't let my words sway you. Korean players love Ezreal due to having high skill expression capabilities. Now that that's over, let's go over some fundamental AD carry mechanics. Kiting is arguably the most important skill every AD carry needs to learn, no matter what champion you play. Due to the squishy and high priority nature of your role, you will notice you are on everyone's hit list. Just standing still and autoing is a good way of bending over and spreading your cheeks open for the enemy to stretch you open wider than Trick's hairline. Constantly moving and making your movements unpredictable makes it difficult for your enemies to hit abilities and close the gap on you. Every champion in the game has an auto attack animation. However, whatever animation happens after the auto attack comes out can be cancelled with a movement command to save time to continue moving before you can throw out the next auto. This will take practice to learn the auto attack speed of your champion based on the items you have throughout the game. Once you get into the rhythm of kiting, you will start to feel the groove. To properly kite, auto attack the enemy, and as soon as the projectile leaves your champion, input a movement command, then rinse and repeat. If you need to practice this, hop into a practice tool, drop down a dummy, and try to auto attack and then move without canceling an auto or standing still for one to two minutes at a time. Once you get comfortable, start adding items that give you attack speed and repeat the drill. All champions have a maximum auto attack range that they can attack from. Even melee champions have a certain range to their attacks. By pressing your A key, your auto attack range indicator will come up. Your champion's true auto attack range is actually slightly larger than what the indicator shows. As an AD carry, your job is to stay at max range as much as possible when fighting. Guma Yusi is one of the best AD carries in the world at the moment and is notoriously known to spam the A key to ensure that he's staying within max range and tethering his opponents through mind games. A clicking can also help you with kiting too. When you press A and left click on your mouse, your champion will then auto attack the nearest target to your mouse. This helps when you're kiting back on an enemy champion to ensure that you don't misclick and walk forward. Be aware though that if you don't have target champions only on, this may have your champion attack a minion by accident. To close up this video, I want to go over some key points you should always keep in mind while playing AD Carry. I won't be going into a lot of detail with these points in this video, but if you want me to help you with anything specific that's about to be mentioned, don't hesitate to reach out in the comment section. Map Awareness My general rule of thumb is I try to take a gander at the map about every 3-5 to five seconds to see what's happening. The minimap provides you an infinite supply of incredibly useful information. What champions are accounted for and which ones aren't, and if they aren't, where were they last seen? Am I in danger? What objectives are up? Based on the objectives that are up, where could the enemy jungler be? Do you have any info on the enemy jungler's camp spawn timers? And if their camps aren't going to be up anytime soon, is it likely that they will be on that side of the map? Where is my jungler on the map, and if I'm going to be ganked, will I have any backup? Example assumptions like these can be made to provide you openings to make plays, make decisions, and most importantly, prevent you from seeing a gray screen. Game state is always changing in this game, and your minimap has the ability to provide you information on whether or not you are in an advanta advantageous position or not. Ask yourself, what can kill me right now? It sounds silly. 
but consciously thinking about this throughout the game and even during champion select can be very useful. It will help you be more proactive about positioning, decision making, and frequency of map information updates in your head. What am I doing when I'm not CSing? When you have no minions to last hit, what would you rather do? Stand around and wait for the next minion to get low enough to last hit again? Or look for opportunities to harass? Your opponents are also trying to CS. If you have no minions to last hit and you see your opponents walking up to last hit their minion, you should never let them get minions for free if you can do something about it. Punish them for walking up and hitting the minions if you are safe to do so. Wave Management This one will take a little bit longer to get down, so don't be too discouraged if you cannot control the wave state right away, as this can be a very complex skill set. But you can know generally where you want the wave to be based on a lot of things like map knowledge and whether you want to base, for example. Say, for example, you have no idea where the jungler is, perhaps the dragon objective is on the map. You haven't seen the jungler in a while. What are the odds that the jungler is on your side of the map? Pretty likely, right? In scenarios like this, generally you want your wave to be closer to your side of the map so you can farm safely. Now, not only are you much safer from ganks, but you are now forcing your opponent to overextend, leaving them exposed to ganks from your team. If you want the wave to stay on your side, you can continue to deny your opponent from gold and experience if done correctly. If you already hold an advantage against your enemy, and you know that your jungler is on your side of the map, if your jungler decides they want to take the dragon, you can build up a wave, crash it under the enemy tower, and come to assist with the objective. This will give the enemy two options, sack the wave and lose on experience and gold to contest the objective, or stay under the tower, farm the wave, and leave the dragon uncontested. This is called lane priority. If your lane is shoved in while your opponent is busy farming the wave under their tower, you are free for a limited time to assist the jungler or ward areas of the map for your team. Once a big enough wave builds up for you, you can slow push it into the tower and get a free base off without losing much as you walk back into the lane. This forces your opponent to back with a less potent buy or to stay in lane to catch the wave and be at an item disadvantage because they won't be able to base in time before you get back into lane. These are just some examples of how impactful wave seat management can be, and where you want the wave to be can change at any time for whatever the reason may be. Knowing when and how to control your wave will come with time, but it always helps asking yourself the question of where do I want my wave to be right now and why? Try to be proactive with asking yourself this and you will naturally learn over time where you want the wave to be at any given time. If you want a lesson on wave management, let me know in the comment section. Item Prioritization Knowing how to build against the enemy team to ensure that you have the most efficient build to do the most damage is important. Don't just blindly follow build guides on apps like Blitz that tell you to build the same thing every game. Look at the enemy's team composition, take note of who's ahead and build accordingly. If the enemy tank is getting really fed and stacking armor, it may be a good idea to delay your infinity edge, say for a Lord Dominic's regards. They say if you position perfectly, you should never die. However, at the end of the day, we are still human and we can't play perfectly all the time. If you already have 3-4 to four items, you may opt to build a defensive item as your last item, given, giving you a little more wiggle room in fights or make aggressive, more aggressive plays. Guardian Angel provides an excellent security blanket, as it gives you an extra life if you're having issues against assassins focusing you down. If there are a lot of AD, Randuin's Omen also provides a good amount of protection. Just know though, no item will protect you completely, always be proactive with positioning, the best defense is always good positioning. Team fights. It is crucial that you do not die in team fights. There is a meme in the AD carry community, but it cannot be understated. You won't do any damage if you're dead. Having the AD carry die, especially early on in the team fights, is probably one of the worst scenarios. Being dead means not only will you not be of any assistance in the team fight, but that time being dead means you can't do anything to accelerate your scaling either. If you survive the team fight, even if the team fight was lost, you can still farm waves or jungle camps, ward and defend objectives if the situation allows. Basically, just don't die. When you feel that a team fight is about to begin, you need to immediately start thinking about where you should be in this team fight to ensure your survival and position yourself there. If you feel that you cannot get into that position in time before the team fight breaks out, you need to judge whether or not the team fight will be a wash or not due to your failure to get into position in time. While your priority targets are always going to be different in different situations, the general rule is that you need 
to hit the highest priority target while being as safe as possible, even if it means the tank. Most of the time, you will just be hitting the tank, unless the enemy positions extremely poorly. This is because most of the time, other targets will be s sitting behind the safety of their front line, which means you would have to step up closer to the front line, a danger zone you need to be careful of about approaching. If you get in range of the enemy front line, they can easily chain CC you and become easy targets for the damage dealers. Part of improving at the game is recognizing when your opponent's misposition or misses a critical ability and being able to punish them for it efficiently. Think of it as whiff punishing in melee. If your opponent in melee misses an attack or gets blocked with a lot of frames of end lag, you wouldn't just let the game state go back to neutral if you had the choice, right? If you see an advantage, keep pushing it as safely as you can. I hope this video helps you on your journey to improve as a weak player. If you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comment section, or if you are a personal friend of mine, feel free to DM me on Discord. This game can be really intimidating, but if you keep pushing at it and focusing on improving one step at a time, you will see improvement, and seeing improvement in this game gives you a huge dopamine boost. Nothing like getting a pentakill to secure your team the dub, right? Thank you for watching. Don't forget to leave a like, subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you again real soon. Until next time.